Great. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Culinary Historians of Chicago. We have a, a baking icon with us tonight and one of the most significant figures in cookbook writing. And uh, in spite of that, she's also my friend, too. So uh, Rose and I go back, I think, more than 20 years. I keep seeing her at conferences when, and when she's visited Chicago. And uh, now we finally nabbed this, this wonderful person for our show tonight. And uh, I'll start off by introducing her. And Rose, I'm gonna ask you to introduce your, your significant other, your partner, your husband, and uh, tell what he does too. But first, uh, a little bit about Rose. Um, here's a quote about her. She's obsessed. There's really no other way to describe cookbook author Rose Levy Berenbaum and her fixation with the minutia of baking. If God is in the details, as the aphorism goes, then Berenbaum must have one foot in heaven. For Rose Levy Berenbaum, no detail escapes the pursuit of perfection. She's the diva of desserts, and that's from the Washington Post. Um, and I, I say her work can certainly be described as biblical. She's written several cooking Bibles, like uh, the one that most of you know about, the, the Cake Bible, which came out in, I think, 1988 and is now still in it. It's in its 60th printing now. And Rose has written, uh, what can you, you, you're going to talk about your cookie Bible tonight, but what are, what are, you have three other Bibles, don't you? What are they, Rose? Let's see. There is the pastry Bible, the bread Bible, the baking Bible, and now the cookie Bible. Yes. And some people are calling Rose's ice cream bliss the ice cream Bible. We should probably have called it that too. Yes, <laughs> they yes, think sure. it that way. Yes, it, it, it is. It is. It's, well, you're sacred. What can I say? But Rose, Rose has been publishing for more than 30 years. Uh, she's the author of 13 cookbooks, in, uh, including what I already mentioned, the Cake Bible that was inducted into the International Association of Culinary Professionals. Uh, well, it was inducted into their, I don't have the word here. What, what was inducted into? Hall of Fame. That's yeah. right. Culinary Classics, they call it. <laughs> yes. And... Uh, Anyway, she's won numerous James Beard Awards, and um, the, and now she's got her cookie Bible out. She's a popular guest on the major TV on major TV shows such as The Today Show, Martha Stewart, The Food Network, and PBS. And she's a frequent contributor to the New York Times and all the major food magazines. Um, at one conference years ago, right after the Cake Bible came out, I stopped Rose in, in the conference hall. And I said, uh, I read, she, I read at the time, she had gotten the largest advance for any cookbook author ever for the uh, cake Bible. I said, is it true that you got a million dollars for your advance? And she said, that's what I read in the papers. And she said, yes, she said, but it was for 10 years of work. I think she had to buy out her old contract. And, uh, and she you know, you don't make much money with this stuff, but she did on this one. And she's going to tell you all the hard work that went into promoting that book and getting this launch. Before I introduce Woody fully, as you did already, sort of, um, I did not get a million dollars for the Cake Bible. I got the lowest possible events they were going to give. Oh, the time, right. They didn't think, I mean, cookbooks, baking books were not in. It was macrobiotic. And the cookbook that they recently done before that on baking failed totally. So they didn't have much hope for it. And Marie Gordon Shelley said, well, how much do you expect to get for this book? When I first met her and I said, I'll do it for nothing if I can have a four color book, which meant pictures on every page. And she said, I can't accept that. Now, Maria was known for all of these editors and publishers were known for taking advantage of the author, but I guess it was kind of like showing the jugular, you know, that when you're willing to be that committed to something, here, kill me. And when Bert Green, who was my best friend at the time, when he heard that I made that offer, he said, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. Well, I'm sure by now it's earned a million dollars because the day it came out in the New York Times, almost two full pages, it sold 18,500 copies in one day. And the reason was because Corby Kummer was writing for the Atlantic, but he wrote this article for the Times. He asked me the key question, 
what is it that makes this cake book special? And they said, I've changed the way in which cakes are mixed to make it easier, faster, and better. So people had to get the book in order to be able to do it. And it really is thanks to him. That, okay, well, it's getting hot down here. Okay. All right, so, so now I'll introduce Woody because Woody has been dubbed by Publishers Weekly as partners in creme, that we are partners in creme, which I love so much, that's what we use. Woody and I have worked together for at least 18 years. And last, it was June, 2021, we actually got married. So now he's my partner, my in partner creme. in creme, my husband. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason that we did this book was because people kept saying you should do a cookie Bible. And I thought, well, you know, I did the Rose's Christmas cookies, but the problem is that people had the perception that those cookies were only going to be made at Christmas time. And of course, the cookie can be made any time of year. Everybody loves cookies. But it's been many years since the Christmas cookie book came out. And I thought I have so many new ideas. And I would like to revisit some of the old recipes I love and improve them. Because having done so many books since then, we found new ways to new techniques. And in fact, we're doing a complete revision of the cake Bible because that much has changed since 40 years ago when I started writing the book. And a lot of the things that I learned by revisiting, I also applied to the cookie Bible. So we had a lot of fun doing this and people are eating it up. And I knew people love cookies, but I didn't know they loved them that much. I mean, it's just like a cookie explosion. So it was really a good move. And mm -hmm. we're so glad we did it. Yeah. So I'd love to open it up to questions, yours, Scott, or anybody else's for that matter. I'll start off with mine. I'll do the live questions and the others will be in a chat. Um, and we have show and tell, by the way. So we have to make sure to do that. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, any samples that you can pass out? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Actually, we do have some cookies around, but it's a little bit hard to pass them out virtually. I can not get those pepper shocker <laughs> What is <laughs> his amazing pepper shocker cookies? We always have them on hand. But should I show you our first, really our first show and tell? That was always my favorite class at school. Because I was really shy, but when I was talking about something else, I forgot about myself. You know, I'm sure you can all relate to that. Anyway, my two friends, Paul Arquin and Chris Taylor, Chris is an artist. They're both, well, Paul is a virologist and Chris is also in, a scientist, and he is, they've written a book together called Pie Guys. Anyway, they also did a cooking book this year, and this is what they did for me to turn me into a giant cookie. You can kind of see it. There's oh. a lot of reflection from it. I've had it for at least three years, I think, or two years, and it's quite amazing that it holds up. I mean, I'd like to frame it, but <laughs> that's kind of high risk. So we'll show the rest of our show and tell a little bit later. Like one of the questions I would like to ask you is about you. Uh, you you're so accomplished. You're again a legend in the field. Again, you're still my friend. But uh, how, I'm, so I, I, I'm, people have baking questions for you. I I want to know how you got started. Uh, you were a medical secretary, right? And and look look what ha how how did you go from being a medical secretary to uh, what you are today? Well, I should let you all know that if I really do what I'm planning, the next book will be my biography. And it was kind of given to me by fate because I picked the name from Edith Piaf's La Vie en Rose, only mine is Ma Vie en Rose, which means the sweet life, my life in en Rose in French. And I have a lot of stories to tell, but I've actually put some of the stories already on the blog. And one was how I got a $25, $250,000 education from NYU free of charge. I won't give it away right now. But I was going to school at night, working full time during the day at NYU, and this would pay the tuition. So I got my bachelor's and my master's. And I didn't want to leave because I really loved it there. But, but what, what did you get your master's? In oh, food science and culinary arts. I don't think it was called that at the time, but since then they call it that. First they went through human ecology, ethology, whatever, and now they call it what it actually was that I studied. And I had an opportunity to audition for the test kitchen of Ladies Home Journal. It happened to be on my birthday. And I went there and I actually, out of 100 people, I got the job. And I found out months later, the reason is that the person who was head of the test kitchen and the food editor of Ladies Home Journal 
uh, she thought that I was ambidextrous. I thought, well, everybody could use both hands, right? You know, I didn't even realize that. It's funny how little quirks may change your whole life. But the one thing that I couldn't do was to decorate cakes. And I tried piping out of a pastry bag and it was like blobs. So I decided to study at Wilton and that was in Chicago. And they were so happy to have me because everybody else already knew how to pipe, but they could impart on me or impose <laughs> the Wilton the way. way. The Wilton <laughs> way. <laughs> and they were actually a little peeved when the Cake Bible did so well because they have all these amazing cakes and books and their books don't sell like that. But it's a whole different world, the world of the cake decorators. And to me, it was more like I wanted to things, things to taste wonderful and have a wonderful texture before I cared about how they looked. So my first real writing article was for Food for uh, America's, what was the name? Cook's Magazine, right? <laughs> that was understanding the Genoise. And Irena Charmers, who became a publisher and then uh, she was a recruiter asked me if I'd be willing to do this. And at that time, they paid next to nothing. But I was so thrilled to see my name in print. The funny part is that one of the cakes that I made in the next article I did for them, understanding the layer cake, the American layer cake, someone came, I was used to make cake uh, wedding cakes to sell. And somebody came in with a picture of Cook's Magazine with bleeding heart cake that I had made. And she said, could you make this into a three layer wedding cake? And I said, Gee, I sure hope so. I mean, I did the article and she said, you did? You know, that's when I realized only my mother's gonna be looking at the byline. You know, <laughs> it's so exciting to see your name in print, but really people don't care that much about it. However, your colleagues do. And that's why when the Cake Bible came out, all the different people who knew what I was doing did a lot of publicity because they were waiting for it. And it's, it's more validating than taking an ad, having people in the profession back cover of it is just so amazing. The different people who gave praise from Jacques Pepin to, um, to Gail Green, who recently died, who wrote for many publications, New York Magazine. It, it was just really wonderful to have that kind of support. So it took a long time between teaching class illegally in my apartment you know, for 10 years mm -hmm. and writing for the magazines. And all that time I was testing recipes because my master's thesis was the basis of the cake Bible. I didn't realize it would become that, but we were supposed to take the simplest topic and take it to its every logical conclusion. And my topic, the simpler the better, they told me, and I took them at their word, was does sifting affect the quality of a yellow cake? And that was how I, after doing numerous experiments after I did that, because you're not supposed to be actually doing the hypothesis, you're just supposed to write what it is and have all the plans for it. But all the while I was testing when I was teaching, I tried out just what difference it made. And I discovered sifting doesn't do anything. It doesn't even evenly incorporate ingredients. So I approached cake baking from a kind of scientific way of looking at it. And once the cake Bible took off, it was just easy to get another contract, which was for Christmas cookies, and then translation of La Passion de Chocolat, the Bernachon chocolate book, and then Pastry Bible, and just went on. And I, I had, looking back, I can't believe that I've spent my whole life writing these books, because they're not small books, they're huge books. In fact, the Cake Bible is a thousand page manuscript, and revising it is even going to be larger. So I feel really privileged to have been getting to do what I love doing, and having it earn some money so I can support myself doing it. Um, but you told me uh, when I talked, well, well, again, what book you did get a million dollar advance, again, not for the Cake Bible. What book was that for? It was your second one. Actually, no, I think it was for, oh. it was a double book contract. And that was when I left and followed Maria Gornichelli to another publisher. So uh -huh. it must have been the Bread Bible. And I don't know, it's, I kind of lost sight. When I write this up, for the memoir, I'm going to have to really analyze what happened when, but it was just like one thing after another, after another, and it wasn't really a million dollars. I mean, it was like, if I got it in a year early, then I would get this, and if I did that, I would get that, but the whole idea was that I was being offered a lot because Maria wanted me to be able to follow her, and in those days, it was the heyday of publishing, and if your book succeeded, they did pay. Nowadays, it's a whole different story. Uh, and you told me then, um, I asked you, um, 
like I was, you know, very, it's a networking organization, the International Association of Culinary Professionals. And I asked you how much you got paid for your uh, freelance articles. I think you told me, and maybe you were talking about the New York Times, like $125. Yeah, was that Nobody wanted to pay anything. And in fact, when I was doing wedding cakes, my late husband, who was alive at the time, he said, wouldn't you rather do fewer cakes and charge more? Just charge what you think you deserve to do it. And nowadays, I mean, Ron Ben Israel charges thousands of dollars for cakes. Then it was, I wasn't charging that much, but I was doing, wearing a lot of hats at the same time. And I remember Maria at one point said, everybody comes into me saying, I want to write a cookbook. I want to see my name in print and I want to earn a lot of money. You came in saying, I'll do it for nothing. And you're the only one who's earning money. <laughs> but that when you really believe in something, you're willing to do it. You know, that, and so it was a good repayment for my attitude. Well, and I was doing a lot of freelancing at that time and getting paid nothing. And I didn't care, but I said, I said to you, you get $125. You're such a big name. I felt sick when you told me that. I said, I said, you're such a big name. And you told me something that kind of changed my life. Uh, you, you said basically something like, yes, but I, I get to do what I love. And you said, if it wasn't for your husband, who was a prominent New York physician, New York City physician, you said, if it wasn't for him, I couldn't do this. Uh, you, you did it, for, and that changed my whole attitude about what I went, instead of saying, look, I got 30 cents for this article in the magazine. And, uh, and I would say, after you, I'd say, yes, but look, at I got a million dollars out of enjoy, enjoyment out of it. So it helped me from getting depressed when I get the checks from the different publications. That's to hear that. But see, the thing is that just because he had money didn't mean that I felt free to spend it if I hadn't earned it in things that I wanted. And I fell in love with copper pots, Fred Bridge's place, you know, I could get it at, they used to have two third off sales. And the only way, I mean, he kept saying, you don't need all these pots, why are you doing this? But the only way I could justify it is that I would sell it to my students and mark it up you know, mm -hmm. until they caught wind of it, that they could go to the Lower East Side or to the, um, where, where is it that they sell things, the Bowery, and get them probably for cheaper. But the, I had this, my whole apartment was turned into a kind of warehouse. See, when um, you're determined, you find a way. Well, what, what, there are so many, 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 many baking books out. Uh, yet yours, I mean, you're you're the big name in in, in one one of the very big names in baking. Uh, what have you done that makes your your books different? Um, I mean, there's a million cookie books out. There's a million anything. We know we track them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yet that there there you are leading the way with with your books. Uh, well, uh, well, I think one of the reasons you're so successful. Before you answer. Um, we were joking about this, and you've joked about this yourself. That that I think you basically say you're obsessive compulsive, and uh, you 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 just really applied that to your uh, obsessive compulsive in a good way. I heard a psychiatrist once say at a lecture that they would love to have a com obsessive compulsive person working for them. So anyway, what what have you? What's the secret? What, why you? Why have you? soared like this with, with I like to say that inequality could be considered a terrible thing or a wonderful thing depending on who's looking at it right so uh, my desire to focus on something and get to the bottom of it can be very annoying I mean I remember that another editor said to Marie Rochelle when she met her in the elevator how can you work with that author because you know, <laughs> editors wanted that you know and I don't think they realized that when you do something, and Maria said that, well, first of all, she said, everybody in here at William Morrow is very excited about what you're doing because everyone wants to be part of building the pyramids. And then she saw that it was gonna be kind of an enormous thing because she understood that I was giving very accurate word of mouth, well, that it was gonna sell by word of mouth. I never thought too bad, I have a funny sense of humor. <laughs> it's funny, like redundant, but, um, I wish I, at the time when she said that everybody wanted to build, be part of building the pyramids, that I pointed out that the Jews weren't all that enthusiastic about it, but I didn't think of it at the time. I understood her point, you know, I know it's terrible. But the thing is that I wanted to make sure that people, when they made my recipe, that it worked for them as well as it worked for me. 
And that was in an era where people wouldn't give out all the information because they wanted to build a business, they wanted to keep their recipes secret. And my goal was to get people to follow my recipes, not to withhold them. It was just kind of the reverse. So Maria said that she thought what was selling the book right from the beginning, in addition to Corby Cummer's article in the Times, was the fact that when people made something, it worked for them. And so often people were afraid of baking. And then a lot of men really related to the fact that there were charts, which a lot of editors wouldn't allow. But the big thing is I put weights. And that was the first book that ever had weights for a cookbook. I don't know if the commercial books must have, you know, because I met many bakers in restaurants who did not use weights, to my amazement. So I think that was another big factor. It was kind of revolutionary. And bottom line, it worked. And that's continuing on today, where you know we consistently use weights, and also the fact that we generally give two parameters almost everything as far as you know when the baking is time, maybe baking time, and also like press in the middle, make sure it's done. To uh, you know the batter is going to look like this. To weighing it out, you know that we make sure that uh, we handhold you all the way through. A lot of people say, "Well, it's like you're in the kitchen with me." Uh, that's why your recipes are so long. <laughs> But I have to say that the best advice I've given to people, and Erin Jean McDowell, who has just written that wonderful savory baking book, uh, she said that she really took to heart when I said, because I was accusing her of working too hard promoting the book, because I know how much it takes out of you, and we've been doing it too. And she said, that's what I learned from you, because I did anything anybody asked me for, whether they paid or not was irrelevant. On my own dime, I would travel and go to places, because I knew that would be very hard to put the book on the map when people weren't buying baking books at the time. And when we, in, the, in those days, if you had a sponsor, for example, because I was the spokesperson for the Dairy Council for Butter, and they sent me to various cities. And every day you would have to do TV or news kind of thing, um, a food editor, a radio show that, um, in fact, I remember that when I did Christmas cookie, the cook, Christmas cookie book, and I came to Chicago, and in those days, they put me up at the Ritz, you know, one of these huge apartments. And the person who was the editor of the major paper, she sent her assistant because she said, how can you feel comfortable writing a Christmas cookie book with a name like Rose Levy Barabelle? And I said, she said, I, my father is a rabbi and I, I just couldn't come and interview you. And I said, well, you know, my great grandfather was a rabbi and he didn't tell me not to do it. <laughs> you know? So it, you know, it was this constantly a fight of proving yourself, proving your worth, proving that what you've done is worthy of attention. And it just never ends. And you've, um, you're, I mean, I, I've told you this and I think everybody tells you this, you sure don't look your age, you're gonna be, uh, you're 78 now, right? Yeah, so when the Cake Bible comes out in this new edition, I'll be 80. Yes. And and yes, so and look at you, you've got such big plans for that. Uh, uh, well, I'm going to go backtrack here. Um, you, you say you take people's hands and hold their hand and guide them through the recipes. Um, well, that's, that's what Julia Child would do. And uh, you could be a gourmet chef if you've never cooked before just by following her recipe exactly. And I imagine that's the same with your, I've, I've cooked from your books. Uh, that's the same with you. you. You can make a perfect cake, just follow what you say. Uh, but speaking of Julia Child, she, you were very close to her, weren't, I was weren't you? Say, we had that conversation about how she was my idol, my ideal. <laughs> I wanted to write the way she did. I wanted to give all the information. And when I finally met her, it was a momentous, probably one of the highlights of my life because when I was on the Today Show, I used to go all the way to Bucks County when I lived in New Jersey. And I would go to, no, actually I went to Philadelphia where she, she was on TV, but she was on PBS and they had a local station there. So I got to see her because I couldn't afford a TV. So you can imagine how much it meant to me when I was on the Today Show when the Cape Bible came out. And the first call I got when I got home was, I'm so proud of you, dearie. That was Julia. <laughs> and I never thought I would meet her, let alone me being on TV, being congratulated by her. So I'm sure you can understand how it was a very major moment in my life. You know, that when you don't expect something to happen and you work so hard, but you still don't expect it, and it happens more than you expect. But you, but you were actually started to get, you and remained very close to her, didn't you? 
you, you became very good friends and you said she was your mentor to a mentor. Yeah, my only regret, because I have very few regrets in life, is that she said she invited me to come and stay with her in Boston when I was on tour. And my editor, Maria, said, oh, don't do that. You won't feel comfortable. So I actually so listened to Maria about a lot of things. I didn't go. <laughs> but I saw Julia for many times and she's always been so supportive. I once called her to ask her, about hiring a lawyer instead of a literary agent. And she said, well, I have to tell you that I've always only used a lawyer, but she picked up the phone. I mean, she didn't even know, I would, you didn't have caller ID in those days. She was very approachable. She always came to ICP and she mm -hmm. would talk to everybody. And yeah, it was just, she was the best and her books were the best. I don't think anything ever equals Julia. In fact, when I was working, when I was contributing editor to Food Arts Magazine, Michael Banterbury, I heard this from my friend who worked with him. He said, well, who will be the next Julia Child? Rosalie Barenbaum or Sarah Moulton? And uh, I thought, no, there will be no next Julia Child. There was only one Julia. But I was glad that he actually considered me in the, in the running. <laughs> well, we, we've had that wonderful Sarah speak to our group. And now we've got you speaking, so I guess we've covered the next possible Julia Childs, and Julia <laughs> Child was going to talk to our group. I heard that. I don't think she knows that. What was that? I don't think I. I don't think Sarah knows that because I never told anybody. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, and Sarah, Sarah is like Julia in her warmth, and uh, mm -hmm. like 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 Julia Child. I referred to Julia Child as she was brilliant at being average. She came across as normal and average. And she she and she she did it with brilliance being being and that's a compliment if somebody's an average person they're they're not highfalutin or snooty or uh, they fit right in with everybody and she wasn't like everybody but she came across like she was one of one of you but uh, and Sarah Moulton said she she kind of absorbed Julia like because she was she became so approachable herself. But uh, you you have some remarkable like tips uh, for baking. One of them, which we put in our program, the reverse creaming technique. Uh, can can you talk about that and a few other things? And then we'll pretty soon turn it over to the audience for their chat questions. Okay, here's a, here are my other props, but they're not related to reverse creaming because okay. this was the technique that I was referring to that was called reverse creaming that I called the two-stage method. And that was what I discovered when I was doing my thesis, when I was experimenting with all the different ways to mix a cake. And that in the commercial world, they did this method and they used high ratio shortening. And that way they could put more sugar in. And I didn't want more sugar. I just wanted to be able to use butter. And in all the textbooks would say, you cannot use butter with this method. The method basically involves starting with the dry ingredients, and then like the flour, the sugar, the baking powder, and then adding the butter and a small portion of the egg or actually the milk mixture because the egg and milk, the rest of it goes in later. So what you're doing is you're coating the flour with the butter and keeping it from absorbing the liquid. To, to, it, does, it prevents it from building up too much gluten development. So the reason that it's preferable is because you can't overbeat, you won't toughen the cake batter and it results in a cake that may be less high but it doesn't dome so overall it is actually higher it has a better texture more velvety more tender and it's called I mean, when i looked in wikipedia one day i was really shocked to see that i invented the reverse creaming method i didn't invent it i adapted it in a way that was told i was told couldn't be done so that's the whole truth of that situation but something that i did invent and this is one of my show and tells too is the reduction spatula. And I don't think you can really see it close up, but it has silicone and it has little ridges. And you know, in any recipe, sweet or savory, when it says reduce the recipe by one third, reduce the liquid from say one cup to a half a cup. And you don't know when you're there until you pour it out, put it back in, thank you. But what I would do is put it in the microwave and wherever it starts, I see where half would be or one third would be. But to my amazement, I didn't know that it would do this, but I tried it out. If you use it in the microwave, what happens is, you know, like if, you try, right there. <laughs> <laughs> if you try reducing liquid in the microwave, it starts bubbling out and it will spray all over your oven and explode. 
So except for butter, you can use any liquid and you don't even have to stir every 20 seconds because it keeps it from bursting. So really proud of this little thing. I mean, I've, I've created a lot of different instruments, but this is my claim to fame. I call it my magic wand because it's also great. It has a good resistant tip for stirring. So you were asking me something else and I got waylaid with my- Oh, any, any other uh, tips yeah. like reverse creaming? I mean, things that can change your whole life in baking uh, like that reverse creaming. Uh, <laughs> yeah. See, to me, the most, two most important tools in the kitchen, especially for baking, are the scale and the thermometer, oh. the, the instant read. We do not have to show the scale, Woody. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get to the scale in a minute. Yeah, what he's very loves to show, especially how eggs have changed recently in the past few years oh, yeah, in size, but that's a whole other issue. That's a, but that's another tip. Anyway, speaking of tips, this is called the Thermopen One because it reads temperature in under well, almost as fast as the human brain in a second. So I actually had designed a mercury thermometer that was the only accurate one around for years until it became illegal to have in a kitchen. And they felt mercury is dangerous. It isn't dangerous unless it's heated and it breaks. I've never broken a thermometer even when I ship them, but if it happens, it would be a terrible thing. So it was taken off the market and along came Thermoworks. They came out with this thermometer. And see, when I use the mercury, mercury is the fastest reacting of any element, but if, if you want to go from room temperature, say 70 to 340, it takes a while to get there. It's faster than anything else. This, I never thought anything would be as good. This is, takes a second to get from that temperature to the other temperature. And you can see it just needs a tiny bit of immersion. So I won't tell the whole long story of how I discovered about immersion and why the thermometer that I work for with, the one with the little red ball on it, when I was making classic buttercream, I had to keep running to the supermarket to get more eggs because it kept frying the eggs when I poured the, the syrup into the yolk. And finally, I actually, I'm telling you the story anyway, I actually immersed it further. It's, I don't know what prompted me to think, just let me see if it goes in more deeply. And it shot up from the 236, it was supposed to be to like 350 because it was designed to read about that much depth. So when I called, I called many different companies and I happened to land on a company that made thermometers for the oil industry where there would be a mass, massive explosion if it were really dead on. And he said, this is my biggest anniversary, 30th anniversary with the company. And because you said you want a small immersion and I'm always trying to convince people that they need a certain specific immersion, I will do it for you. How many do you want for your first run? And I said, well, I have a class. I think about 24 people would like to have it. <laughs> and he said, wouldn't you take a gross? And I said, what's a gross? <laughs> you know, I knew nothing about <laughs> merchandising. I knew nothing about shipping. And the amazing thing that happened is that the head of Universal Foods, Liberty uh, Foods was called at the time, he, uh, he offered as a friend to have his glass expert shipped them for me to distributors, to the top 12 distributors. So I couldn't do all the shipping myself. Everyone broke. So I called the company that made them and I said, how do you ship thermometers? And he said, don't use bubble wrap. It puts pressure points on it and it will break. Use clumps of newspaper, inexpensive, free, and use enough distance between the, stuff, the packaging and the cardboard the box. So I've never had a single one break. And I did this for many years until they were taken off the market. So that's the story of my second most important thing. Otherwise, um, <clears throat> weighing though, that's our biggest tip. Yes. I think, I'm not yeah. sure which is more important, thermometer, but there's weigh. a reason you have to choose. <laughs> weigh. Yeah, weigh to bake. <laughs> yeah. The reason why I'm saying you should weigh is uh, this came up in our discussion earlier today on where a person, <clears throat> the, the moderator was complaining that I don't make cookies because I get so many dirty dishes. And I said, well, use them for measuring out your ingredients. And she said, yeah. So, well, if you mm -hmm. weigh, then like cases, you don't have to, you can eliminate most of your dishes because you're not having the measurement of that device. You can put them right into the mixing bowl or a food mm -hmm. processor and you just weigh in the ingredient. You don't have to worry about sifting in a lot of cases or whatever. And the other, the other advantage of weighing is that you have a judge to see if you actually put everything into the pot or into the, yeah. into the dough or into the batter because in our books, we generally put the weight of the total ingredients on there. So you can add up the chart and, or wherever's author you have, read up their chart, 
if they have grants. And if uh, they say 1,200 and you're mixing away and you got the batter, you got your dough and you're at 1,000, well, you probably forgot to put something in. And yeah. it, it's happened. It's happened to us uh, more times than we want to admit. The only time it's too late is when it's in the oven and then it really is too late. You can't take it yeah. out and mix it in. But that, that's the key because uh, with that, it's faster, easier, definitely more accurate. Uh, and, and something else, too, that I think just about everybody who's listening to this, uh, viewing this this program knows this, but just in case, when when you have a cup of flour, it, it how, how much have you packed it? How lightly have you put it in? It, a cup of flour means nothing. How much, how much does it actually weigh? And I think that's one of the, you know what I mean? A cup yeah, of flour. Saying, depending on how it's measured, you could end up with one, one and three quarter cups of flour instead of one. Yeah. Especially if you have a heavy hand and it's been sitting and settling and then you dip yes. it and you just have no idea yeah. what it is. And that's one, especially one advantage of weighing because if, uh, we've seen many author books, when we go to a bookstore, we'll you know, grab somebody's book and look at it and they'll say, all purpose flour. They don't say if it's bleached or if it's, Unbleached, and then we'll also go look to see did they tell you how to measure? In a lot of cases, they really don't. So, you, well, what measurement did they use? See, if they see, have weight, when people, you, then, when then you ask me how out. people, why they trust my recipes or why, what that sets this book apart, is that the devil is not in the details. And oh, by the way, our production manager, the one who has created the silicone spatula and, and various other things, not the thermometer has recently put out and honored the book, The Cookie Puzzle. He does the heart puzzles out of Chicago. Out of so, Chicago. Yeah, so I just had to show you this. I just got these a few weeks ago. Oh, yeah. And they have, so there's some few cookies that are not ours, but the rest of them are all from the book. Plus you can see on the cover of the book is wow. that cookie, the cookie, <laughs> actual little cookie photo of the, the two pie guys yeah. and put it on there. Yeah. Not all the cookies on here are ours because they have the yeah, collection. Yeah, that's a cookie, <laughs> cookie too. Yeah, that, what's that Oreo's doing on there? <laughs> you know, <which> <laughs> but quite a few are ours. But he said, well, we can't leave any cookies that are loved by people out of it. So it'll be fun doing it. I can't wait to see it in a large size and then we'll start putting the pieces together. You, your, your books also, they, they have weights and, and measurements like a cup too, right? So. Oh, you, of course. Oh, yeah. You yeah. Have to you know, yeah. It's not um, everybody is covered, yeah. although most people seem to be coming along getting religion, so to speak. We look at the baking books and we see that most of like 90% of them have weights now. Mm -hmm. and, and again, now uh, we talked about this too. Now you can easily get a kitchen scale, a little kitchen scale and keep it in the cabinet where we didn't have those years ago. Yeah, so, they're accurate and they're not expensive. Yes. I mean, and, I remember once a colleague was saying we were on the same radio show together and he said, yeah, but scales aren't accurate either. And I said, but they're less inaccurate than measuring cups. Yes. Really <laughs> shocking how those, those glass beakers vary. And some of them even have slanted reading. So you can't, I mean, the, you're always taught to use the, to go under the meniscus, that little bubble. And that's where you read when it comes right above that line. But if the line is not even level and it's not accurate, <laughs> you won't go to that. Could be a problem. Forget the meniscus. It's, it's a crapshoot, so to speak. Or, or on, on top of that, a lot of people, and they say, Measuring cup, they're not sure if it's a solid, yeah, solids one or, or one or, with a spout. Or, or with a spout. So, and they're different, you know. Well, Ro Rose knows. So, I, I would advise everybody read what Rose has to write about measurements. And my last question is uh, can you talk a little bit more about the cookie Bible? Like, how did you have the nerve to write a, another book about cookies? You know what what's in there that that you wanted to say that hadn't might maybe hasn't been said before. Um, it's not so much that I said in the, all these years since I wrote the Rose's Christmas Cookies, there have been a lot more new cookies that have come up uh -huh. that I loved. But I also, as I said before, I think I wanted to revisit the old ones with the knowledge mm -hmm. I now have and improve them. So that was the motivation and. I wanted a stitch binding. I mean, many people tell me that the Christmas cookie book has fallen apart. We put ours in three ring binder. <laughs> Maria told me that it was Which stitched. Is she lied. <laughs> so uh, so it's uh, such a beautiful design. Plus, we now put a mise en place, which means advanced preparation. So you don't get halfway through a recipe and think, oh, it didn't soften the butter. You know, it's all, it's beautifully designed. Yeah. We're really thrilled with it. But we should tell you some of our favorite well, cookies. Well, very yeah. quickly. 
the other reason for doing the cookie Bible was it was completing the four generations, four genres of baking. You know, we have <clears throat> cakes, pies, bread, well, cookies. So <laughs> that completes the four. And it completes my thoughts. So there you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think of it that way, but once you pointed it out, I thought, yep, yeah, it's a good thing. Okay. Well, and said, well, is it does that every cookie in the world? And I said, well, no, that's an encyclopedia. This is a Bible. <laughs> Bible doesn't have the whole story necessarily. Okay, so we have a whole list of our favorites, and Woody's pepper cockers is one of everybody's favorites. I have to say, you can tell about that, and then I'll tell about some of my yeah. favorites. Find it first. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is that Woody studied tai, tai Chi when he lived in the Twin Cities, and his Sifu, his te master teacher, his mother had a wonderful recipe for this. A Scandinavian recipe. It's very spicy, it's crispy, it keeps for months, if not a few years. And it can be, as Woody likes to say, riding the cusp of sweet and savory because it's really good spread with goat cheese and it's just good munched by itself. We just had some earlier today. Mm -hmm. We're never without pepper cockers. That's what he wanted to get to run up and show you, but I don't think you need to see them. He's going to right. find it in the. There we go. There we go. Uh, There's our pepper cockers. They're kind of like a Moravian spice crisp, but not quite as thin. And they're like about silver dollar size, about the same thickness. Yeah, and they don't have to have that sugar on top of it. In no. fact, you know. And if they get soggy, if they're, if they're stored, you can just stick them in the oven again. That's another tip. When you bake cookies, you don't want to overbake them because you can't unbake them. But cookies are very forgiving. So if you take them out before they're fully baked and you think, oh, I'd like them to be a little bit crisper, you can put them back in or the next day you can bake them. This is not true of all genres of cookies like meringues, but it's true of a lot of other cookies. Shortbread, of course, is classic. And somebody just wrote that she gave some to her friend when she made them from the book and her friend's from, um, where's shortbread? Scotland, of course. And she said that not since my grandmother made these did I taste shortbread like that. And that really meant so much to me because I've tried many different versions of using rice flour, which makes it more crisp, but just the plain old purpose flour. And then a really good friend, Marissa Rothberg Bates, she gave me the version, her version of peanut butter shortbread. And then there's a brown sugar shortbread, but just the plain classic one, that's one of people's favorites. Our production editor at the at a publishing house is from Greek ancestry, and she gave us her grandmother's recipe for kularakia. Very simple, beautiful dough to work with and make different shapes. Um, the lemon cranberry bars. Lemon bars have always been a favorite because they're shortbread and lemon curd, which it doesn't get better than that until I decided to make a layer of cranberries in the middle of them. Wow. These dried cranberries, you moisten them by heating them and cooking them a little bit. And I would never just make plain lemon butter bars again. Truff, the absolute favorite truffle cookies. This was a gift, this recipe from, well, it's, it's a long story, but Zach Townsend is the top translator of French cookbooks in this country. And yeah, and they have truffles baked into them. He also is a chocolatier and he teaches chocolate classes in Texas, Dallas, Texas. And it's so wonderful to have that crunchy, cr the cookie dough, cookie crust. And then you bite into it and the center has not heavy oozing, but creamy ganache in the middle. Believe it or not, everybody loves Christmas wreaths. And the first time I made them at Ladies Home Journal, I was shocked to think that they wanted me to put this in the magazine because it has cornflakes and marshmallows, that's all it is. And then you put little cinnamon red hots for decoration. It's actually good to eat. I don't usually mm. eat this kind of thing. So, and they're very pretty. Uh, what else? Spritz, of course. Spritz, such a simple cookie, but the almond flavor is really beautiful. Rugelach. And Hamantash and the two Jewish cookies, uh, Eastern European, anyway. We love those. And this is Woody's, what do we yeah. call them? Luxury brownies? Uh, Woody's brownies. Oh, Woody knows. <laughs> Woody's luxury brownies. Yeah. They're luxurious because they have a layer of white chocolate uh, buttercream and the topped with ganache. And then a chewy, mm -hmm. moist brownie. And then this is a one for Christmas because my mom made these. Not with the white, uh, not with our white chocolate frosting. She had the old white <clears throat> and frosting with the shortening and the uh, powdered sugar, and we just translated to something more palatable. 
in our opinion. In fact, what are we used to fix? Yeah. Uh, what else? Oh, something for your favorite dog for Christmas. <laughs> it's the party time of the year. Bonafide. <laughs> My brother owns Pet Food Express in the Bay Area. And so he asked me when I did the Christmas cookie book. Initially, he said, can you put something in for dogs for, to promote my stores? And I, I said, are you going to carry the book in your store? He never did. Yeah, but, yeah. So there's, and I, your dog like, should be treated as well, yes. Yeah, they're good for the, actually good for the dog. Even man's best friend. Oh, my absolute favorite. And I usually just make this around holiday time because in the summer, caramel and toffee doesn't hold up as well. But it's the double chocolate toffee. You know, that wonderful crunchy caramel center, and the outside is paved with chocolate and then studded with almonds. I think it's almonds I use. Right? Yes. Yeah, right. Um, what else? Well, of course, I love all the cookies, but these are the ones that just rose to the top when I thought, I'll make a list. Bourbon balls. Oh, it's a bit late to start them now, although they're good, even when they don't sit. But the bourbon balls, if you make them with your own chocolate wafers and then you add enough bourbon, they keep for a really long time. They keep getting better and better. You can ship them. Kind of like fruitcake, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Anything with alcohol in, not only preserves, so, but it improves. So we just wrote this today, didn't they? About look off of the it's for another book. It's for one of our cake books, Heavenly Cakes. But it's a uh, the the fruitcake wreath. And they said, well, can you use something other than liqueur or bourbon alcohol. or alcohol? Yeah. Okay. And my first thought was maybe a lemon glaze, you know, which is people basically said, but it will not age. It just, it's good. I love cakes. In fact, one of my favorite cakes is the lemon poppy seed cake in the cake bar that's a pound cake. But I also have a lemon poppy seed cookie. Oh, the Madeleines. Okay, Madeleines. The chocolate Madeleines I love because Madeleines are notoriously dry. And I know when you go to restaurant Danielle, if you're a special person, they'll give you madeleines that come right after dinner, hot out of the oven. And they have to be given right then because when they sit for an hour, they dry. It, so I thought, why not make my favorite cake, which is the lemon poppy seed pound cake, into the madeleine shape, brush it with a lemon glaze, and then it stays moist mm -hmm. even till the next day. But the chocolate ones are even better because that's brushed with ganache. Mm, getting mm -hmm. hungry just thinking yeah. about. So do we have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, you said Madeleine's. We've got one of Chicago's top cooking teachers listening in, uh, Madeline Bullwinkle. So uh, speaking of <laughs> Madeleine's. So uh, anyway, hello, Madeleine. It's good seeing you again. And anyway, we're going to, Kathy is going to read the chat questions to you now. Right. And uh, she's going to pepper you with questions now. And actually, some of them have you've kind of answered, but we'll get through it. But what is the most important thing in making an excellent cookie? I have a feeling I know the answer, but the ingredients. I mean, there's so and, few ingredients that you want to use the right ones and the best ones. Okay. I thought that in measuring. It's it means ingredient be, selection be, and measuring. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're right. You're right. So, to the very beginning when you start out you want to use the best and then of course the rest is a given if you don't there's so many factors you know like are you going to make them all the same size on the cookie sheet otherwise the ones that are small bake first and if you keep baking to make until the large ones are done they'll over bake or if you under bake then the larger ones are you know it's you have to give some care and thought as to how you do it if you want to be perfect a lot of times i've seen cookies with burnt bottoms some cookies and some ovens bake too hot so either you can raise it up to a higher shelf or you can double pan instead of using one of those insulated cookie sheets for that type of cookie you can just put two pans together and parchment also helps to prevent browning i think it's a real sin to over brown your bottoms cookie so bottoms. uh oh go ahead i'm sorry Oh, okay, so uh, by the way, somebody said your pot investments look fabulous. Your good. copper pots, your copper pots. Oh, oh. <laughs> you wouldn't believe the collection of those copper pots. One is lined with silver. When I went to show it to our editor who came by to visit a couple of days ago, I saw the whole thing was totally tarnished. But you know, silver is the ultimate conductor. So I really wow. Oh, I shouldn't use it. Thank so you. what is what is your oldest cookie recipe? The, the almond crescents. Because the first cookie I ever made was an oatmeal cookie. And I mean, A-N oatmeal cookie, because 
I used the back of the Quaker oatmeal box. I was 19, 17. And <laughs> it became, it spread all over the cookie sheets to become one giant cookie, which was not intended. So, and I know I followed the directions, but they probably weren't as precise as the ones I like to give now. You know? So it was several years before I made any cookie and I was working at educational testing service in Princeton and somebody brought in the almond press and, and it was tender and buttery and so simple. And she gave me the recipe and that was the first cookie I made successfully. So what's your favorite cookie baking sheet? Probably wherever. I mean, it's, it's, if, you, if you take a sheet and you go from side to side and it doesn't torque, you know, it's, it won't warp in the oven. And it's surprising that you don't need any really, really fancy ones, just a simple, see what I meant by if you hold it like that, see, it's not going to bend. And it's well insulated. Well, it's, it's, and that, the, okay, but you would you double those together? Yes, sure. you don't need to. But no, yeah. No. Continues. Some really cookies go. have higher sugar. Yeah. I don't like too much mm. sugar, like six tablespoons for a couple of flour. Yeah, so rigid too. <laughs> so because I don't like uh, too much sugar in a cookie, I don't have a tendency to have them burn. But some sugar cookies are that inherently going to burn because they have to have more sugar. So that's why you have to be more careful. Sure. Uh, Peggy has the cookie Bible, and she wants to. She's asking your suggestion for a real people pleaser because she's going to bring it to a party tomorrow for about 60 people. What would you recommend? The jumbles. Some people don't like too much sweetness and the jumbles have just enough dough to hold together all these wonderful nuts. So as long as that nobody's allergic to nuts, they're easy to make and they're just a real winner. And especially if you wanna make that many. It's coming up in a couple of days. No, it's coming up tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> is that Work time enough? Ask. Can you just have to ask run me? to the store first thing in the morning if she doesn't have everything at her home already? Where can we get this reduction spatula? I've seen it on Amazon. I mean, during COVID and with the problems with China, I think it, it was out of stock for a while, but hopefully it's back in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I hope that Daniel, uh, Daniel O'Malley, who's, who lives in Chicago, is listening so that he is inspired to make sure that there's lots of them available. Okay, do you have, oh, I'm not sure I'm reading this question right, but I'll read it the way it's stated. Do you have dogs for the dog cookie recipe? Oh, do you own dogs? That's the deal. Oh, we don't. <laughs> My brother owns dogs, is that okay? <laughs> In fact, he supplies all the money from one of his stores once a month best for the police dogs to protect them. In San Francisco. As far as I've stopped having animals for many years when I started making wedding cakes because there's always hair or jumping up on stuff. So I love dogs, I love cats, but this recipe comes from my cousin's best friend in Maine who gave me the recipe. And I, I always like to acknowledge and credit people. So her name is in the book too. I tested them not on myself. <laughs> we have friends and neighbors who have dogs too. Kathy, uh, before yes. before you read the next question from Madeline Bullwinkle, I just want to say something about Madeline. But also, Madeline has her hand up. Does that? Yes, I know. But I wanted to get through all those questions up to that point. Right. Um, so, but uh, yeah, I didn't know what a hand up meant. But uh, it means she's and I've asked her to unmute. So. Okay, it's but, up to her now. But I want before anything happens, I just want to say Madeline about 30 years ago called me and said to me, We're starting this group, Culinary Historians of Chicago, and wow. I'd like to ask you to be involved. And I said, I don't know if I'd fit in. It sounds too academic for me. So here I am today. Thank you, Madeline, for, for <laughs> this wonderful yeah. gift you gave me. So my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, Rose about butter, because I found that there is a substantial difference between the American butters and European butters. And I don't know whether people are aware of the change it makes. And uh, so I'd like to have her take on it. Uh, I used to, in fact, I regret putting the names of products in the books because I never thought that Organic Valley would take this, pull this butter off the market, but they had cultured butter and the cultured butter has such wonderful flavor and yes. butter fat content as any other average butter. The French butters have a higher butter fat content, as you know, Madeline, and higher butter fat means that there's less water, there's more fat. 
So more water means that you have a puffier cookie and more fat will be too tender, it will spread more if the recipe was designed to be used for butter. So I'm very specific as to which one I call for. And the one time I, said, mm. I like high fat butter for laminated doughs and for buttercreams. That's where you can't go wrong with it. Do you comment on that in your cookie book? The, yeah. the difference between the performances of the two butters? All purpose flour, because if you're using unbleached flour, it won't spread as much and it won't puff as much because it absorbs the water. So it's all a balance of liquid and there's water and eggs, even if you're not adding water to it. Right, right. So all, I mean, the devil's in the details, as you said, that you have to know these things to get the best results. Thank you. Okay, so I've asked Bill, a friend of mine, Bill, but I don't rarely have to pronounce his last name. So I'm going to avoid saying it, but he's a, a biologist who teaches at DeBall University, and he's a very excellent baker, but I thought he could just ask his question directly. Go ahead, Bill. Bill? <laughs> I'm Where's mute. Bill? Oh, he's here. I'll ask him to unmute again. There we go. Go ahead, that Bill. Sorry. Um, I, um, so I, I learned to bake from the pie and pastry Bible, uh, and I came to baking um, from science. Uh, I had 10 years of laboratory experience. I'm a, I'm a biologist. And so I, I love your cookbooks because your recipes read like lab protocols. Um, they, they feel exactly like that. So I had a question about your process. How many iterations and adjustments do you typically make to a recipe before you consider it finished? A lot fewer than used to be. I mean, I finally know what I'm doing. <laughs> No, seriously, Although, I know what in each ingredient contains, and which gives me a really head start, but we very rarely get it right the very first time. What would you say, Rudy? Like five, seven, five to seven tries. Mm -hmm. And it depends also what we're doing. If it's something like we were doing a chiffon cake, which is generally done in a butt pan, the we two. have a center tube, mm -hmm. or I mean a two-piece pan, and we want to make it into a layer pan. And that one took 27 tries because along, once I hit, and I was doing mainly the testing, and once I hit that level I thought was good, I wanted to take it, let's say it was three and a half teaspoons baking powder. I took it up to three, and let's say three and three quarter baking powder, I took it down to three and a quarter baking powder. I wanted to see where it could take and make it fail. So then we had the you know right amount. So uh, generally seven times maybe we do it and then uh, well, we also try things with different ingredients because if we're not sure if it'll be different with whole eggs versus all yolks versus uh, one type of flour rather than another that that's worth trying several times because we want to get the best possible thing yeah. that we can okay we ask somebody else Boychik, uh, Emily Winston Winston Yep. 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 <laughs> yeah. um, we're just visiting her in the Bay Area. She's from New Jersey and she makes the best bagels I've ever had. And Woody wanted to, to know how many years it took her to get them to where they were. And I think she said five. Five right? years. Yeah. But she started off without being a baker, too, which is very smart. So, yeah. how, so what it is you're trying to accomplish as to how much work it, it takes? How much should a cup of flour weigh? Depends on what kind of flour. I mean, cake flour, if you sift it into the cup, it's 100 grams. If you sift all purpose into the cup, I think it's more like 121. But if you spoon it lightly, it's more like 130. So I don't think in the new cake Bible we're going to give a chart of weights. Oh, yeah, for the critical ingredients, just in case people want to apply it to other recipes other than ours. But, but you know, the big problem was the baking powder because it's the one ingredient that changes every time you measure it. And of course, measuring spoons are all different too. So over a period of a year, I took the weight and I got it to 4.5 grams and you need a super accurate scale. But when you measure it, it's never the same unless you sift into the spoon. And I know nobody would tolerate my being that excessive. So I'm hoping, you know, what I say instead is if you find with a cake, for example, that the cake is too tender, then decrease the baking powder slightly because you probably have different measuring spoons and the baking powder is not the same. But the salt is always six grams per teaspoon, unless you have a different set of teaspoons. <laughs> you know, this is what we're operating with is all these variables. But at least we can try to get it ready right for ourselves and we hope to get 
adjustments for people who may not have the same equipment, but what they're looking for in the final result and how they can alter what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, what about almond flour? Are there any good cookie recipes with almond flour? I think we generally make our own by grinding it in the food processor because almond flour is a lot finer. It's almost a powder. And also things that come as flour, especially nuts get rancid really quickly. We keep most nuts in the refrigerator, in the freezer. Oh, in fact, the most important advice I have is that for walnuts, walnuts are a really bad culprit of rancidity and they'll ruin the whole batch of cookies. That has happened to me. You have to taste the walnuts because it doesn't smell rancid and they go really fast. So as soon as I buy walnuts into the freezer, and it's, of course it's great if you have one of those little vacuum machines because then things keep even longer. Rose, so the ingredients of the making and breaking of the recipe. Uh, uh, years ago, when I was really trying to do everything right, I bought a, a nut grater or nut grinder, you know, but crank by hand. Uh, what 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 do you think of those? Are they necessary or, or is it are they nice but not necessary or uh, to have a nut grinder to grind your own nuts? Processor with a grating wheel that works really well, and then you can switch. Oh. For example, if you take hazelnuts and they're round and they're hard and you try to grind them up with the wheels, with the blades, you'll end up probably getting a paste by the time they grind up. So nuts like that, I say to start with a grating wheel. Is it the wheel grating? Well, it's like a little grating thing that sits in the food processor and then use the blades to grind it more evenly. But there was a problem with something. What was it? Not hazelnuts. Oh, almonds. That ends up being paste even more easily because it's a soft nut. So re recipes where we're using almonds, what we do is suggest buying sliced, not slivered, which are coarser, but the sliced, are, they grind up beautifully with the blades. But sometimes I also recommend that people add some element from the batter, the dough rather, like whether it be sugar or flour, just a little, it helps it to keep the, the grains of the nut separate so that they don't become pasty. Uh, also, uh, what cook? Go ahead. I'm going to say also the uh, with the pie and pastry bible. The we suggest also going on our website. Mm -hmm. If you get the crust, we use almost all the time now is roses, cream. flaky cream cheese, cream and butter crust, which mm -hmm. is on the website on our uh, baking recipes page. It's, it's back to the first one. So yeah, and instead of using water that's in the original pastry bible. I now use cream and it makes such a difference because it's still tender. I mean, it's more tender, but it's still strong enough to be able to make the lattice and bend it back and flex it. And so it's more flavorful, more tender, and I really recommend that. Yeah, that, that's our go-to recipe at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah, things um, are evolving. We do it all the time. Uh, what are the best decorating sugars? I don't use a lot of decorating stuff. So you can, I don't know if you can see over there, but I've got tons of these sprinkles and India Tree makes beautiful ones. I don't think I can say what the best are. Yeah, we really don't. Mm. <laughs> yeah. You know, even in the cake Bible, I've, I tend to do things. And I think the trend is that way as well. I like the cakes to speak for themselves and the cookies too. I like to see the texture of it. That's why I like bun cakes because you see the texture from the shape of the bun. And with cookies, there's some that you want to decorate, for example, Christmas cookies. Oh, and that's another really good tip, is that with a Christmas cookie, you need to have a good fine surface to decorate. And if you have cracks, it's not gonna be very good. So the finer the sugar, the smoother the surface. And that's why when I use a food processor and I give that as my first preferred method, you can grind up the sugar into super fine. It's less less expensive than buying super fine in the, in the, in the supermarket, but don't confuse it with fine granulated. That's what's commonly available in the bags. You can buy that and then just use the food processor to grind into a fine texture. And then also if you're using brown sugar and it's a little bit lumpy, I grind it together with the, either the flour or with the flour or with the, the refined sugar and to make the whole thing be finer. So what cornflake brand is the best for the wreaths? <laughs> I don't think it really matters. I mean, how many brands are there? Kellogg, was that what we used to use? Cornflakes? I mean, yeah. It might even be good with the whole wheat ones. Like Kellogg. 
My, my nieces love those. If you let and, them dry for a few days or weeks, they, they get almost shellacked. You can wear them like jewelry. That's actually one of the issues because I have to make them and then pack them. Uh, there they are. Yeah, and they're somebody, really sticky. Yeah. We had somebody ask today, can I put M&Ms on there instead of the red yeah, Mini, mini M&Ms. She said, I'm not sure I'd like the flavor of the m and m it would be so tart. And I said, yeah. You the red, the red hot. Yeah, the red hots. Because, <laughs> thank you. Because the, uh, I said, well, there's so much sugar from the marshmallows that it kind of counteracts them. So is Irish butter uh, a, a best choice for butter? This was just somebody's question. Sorry. Irish? We like the Irish. No, uh, they, they as long as the butter fat is yeah. in the range that you're supposed to be using. Yeah, it's a, they have ones that is a, that is the same butter yeah. fat and other varieties because yeah. we yeah they were actually sponsors remember scott at the icp conference in pittsburgh and we got a whole bunch of coupons and we learned a lot about caribou and the different types but i don't know if they announced it i think i had a call or write to them to find out if the basic one is the same butter fat content as a land of lakes um or organic valley because they do have a, a regular yeah. butter i think you know even though it's not the cultured butter anymore I, I love Kerrygold, uh, and but and let me ask you uh, something. I I have my own opinion on it, which is a good opinion. But what do you think of Land of Lakes? I like it a lot. Uh -huh. it's in also, there. <laughs> also, when we make when we make clarified butter, it, that's when I might use high fat butter because it spurts less with the water not being there to evaporate as much. You know? But what, what I do now, and this clarified butter definitely in some of these cookies and. People don't like making it because they never know when it's ready or if it spatters all over the stove. But if you do it slowly, it doesn't spatter at all. You just have to have the patience and stir the whole time because then as it browns, the, the caramelization flavors the entire butter. And you can see what's happening because you want it as dark as possible, but not getting black and bitter. And can I use the solids in the cookies. That's the secret of my chocolate chip cookies. Uh -huh. Do you use a lot of brown butter in your yes. recipes? Yeah. Yeah, that, that wonder, wonderful taste that gives. So what cookbook would you recommend for people who can't tolerate gluten? Fran Just in case. Fran huh? Fran Costigan has, is a wonderful food writer. She does classes, virtual classes. Um, I'll get the one, Alice Beverages. Oh, yeah, Alice Medrich also, Flower Flavors. Flavor flowers. Well, one or the other. There's we have books here in the baking kitchen, and also upstairs. But this this is one we have right nearby because it's one that we consult. Yeah. Wonderful yeah. brownies yeah, using uh, tech. Consulting it right now upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. Yeah. We have three stories yeah. here. Yeah. So when we moved here full time, because this was my weekend place for many years, and it was an unfinished basement. So in order to move all the stuff from my New York kitchen, I had to convert the downstairs to a baking kitchen, which is great because to be able to separate the savory from the bakery, from the baking, it's a real advantage. I don't have to worry about, oh, did I use that spatula for garlic? Because you can never get the smell out of it. So a whole separate set, different colors. You know, <laughs> people can do that too. If they use for baking, maybe get yellow instead of red or something like that. Because that does flavor. In fact, butter and chocolate pick up other flavors like this. Nothing, no tomorrow. Nothing else does as much, and you can't get rid of them. And stuff. This is the thing about some of these quote synthetic products is that with stainless steel, you wash it or glass, and it's all odors are gone. But silicone, which is so wonderful, keeps the odors. Can whole wheat make a good cookie? I like to actually roll cookies sometimes in buckwheat flour, it gives it a wonderful flavor. But whole wheat. You'd have to work with it to make sure that you develop the strength because otherwise it could be crumbly. It doesn't have the same ability to develop gluten because the bran is like little knives that cut through the flour. It would cut through the flour as you mix it. So sometimes what I do when I'm making bread and I want to use whole wheat <clears throat> is I sift out the bran and process it. And then I noticed that Mason Mirholz's uh, bread book, I can't think of his name right now, that wonderful baker who used to teach at the culinary. He wrote the oh. bread book and he has the same thing in his book. So uh, uh, Peter Reinhardt? No. 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 Francois. Francois uh, with an M. 
Mikoya. Francisco, Francisco. Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're going to ask me how many books I have. <laughs> uh, where can one buy a silver lined mixing bowl? Well, a silver lined silver mixing bowl? bowl? Well, <laughs> I think maybe you're thinking about that silver lined copper pot you have. You know, I got mine at Fred Bridge and in New York. He's died years ago, but there was only one hanging there. And he said, you should really get that. <laughs> I don't think it's being made anymore. But I remember when my first publisher was Irena Chalmers. I may have mentioned her. Had you ever heard of her, Scott? Or met her? I, I knew her pretty well. And uh, yes, and I used to it's reminisce with her at conferences, you know, while, while she was on this earth. Yeah, and I cooked from her book. But it's, it's good gossip. And since she's not alive anymore, she won't mind. Yes. She was invited to this really exclusive dinner at. Well, she was a character too. So, yes. Circle, some really special place. And she met uh, one of the like, Frere Toigro, I forget which of those brothers, from that wonderful restaurant in Paris. And the next morning, I happened to go up to see her. And she said, Well, I spent the night with him. We drank deeply of each other. And in the morning, she gave, he gave me this little silver pot. And I thought I would hit him on the head with that. <laughs> but silver is the best conductor. And he had made the special sterling silver, 100%, not lined, the entire pot of silver. And he was giving it to the top people at this party. So I thought it was really nice to be able to have it. But under those circumstances, I would not have accepted it. <laughs> OK, that's all the gossip I'm going to tell. <laughs> Uh, by the way, Elaine commented that people who keep kosher kitchens often use color coding. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. that's exactly yeah. the mm -hmm. concept. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a kosher house, and I remember when my grandmother, when some, my father, who was not at all observant of anything, he was in fact a, an atheist, and when yeah. he said correctly, she would have to bury it in earth to make it kosher. That's how I learned about that. I don't know the principle behind it, but it kind of regenerates it. So I think we'll, uh, and somebody has identified where you can buy silver lined copper. It's in the chat. Uh, so if you, uh, it's, uh, I'll send you the link. It's, it appears to be in France, I think, but we'll find out. Uh, but I, I have, if you don't mind. So if we had a normal meeting, which we had three years ago, I would be involved in making the samples for today. And you're one of the few people where I could give the recipe to somebody and know it will show up likely to be right. I, I say that because people sometimes still do the substitute thing. And that was that was kind of where I'm leading up to. So uh, people are interesting. You know, they'll make your recipe, they'll make significant substitutions. And then probably come back to you to go, why didn't it work? Because I listen to this kind of thinking a cookbook club. Mm -hmm. And I'm always telling them, well, if you didn't follow the recipe, what did you expect? <laughs> yes, it's puzzling. Once when I gave a demo at uh, the Degustavus in New York City, and I invited Maria Gornicelli, and she had her husband come as well. And Somebody stood up in the middle of my making a banana cake and said, is there a substitute? And I couldn't believe what she was going to say. The banana. I thought, well, don't make a banana cake, make another cake. But before I could open my sarcastic mouth, her husband was even more sarcastic. He said, yes, watermelon. Any <laughs> 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 time somebody says, can you, I know the next word is going to be a substitute. So what do you say in fact, to we people? Agree. Yeah, yeah. I've had people. three people in the last two days on a website ask for a substitution. Takes care of it. So he yeah. he tells people always make it the first time the way that mother intended, and then substitute. But as you guys know, as, as we're scientists, you don't change more than one variable. You know, there's the control. So if you do two or three or even two, you don't know which is the responsible for what you didn't want or did. Yeah, you know? yeah the nice thing. Uh, Two of the questions were about cookies, which makes it easy because they it was mean like, uh, should I use hazelnuts or should I use walnuts? Well, do the walnuts and recipe, but you know, make a half batch or a quarter batch and then put hazelnuts mm -hmm. in the other half batch. Then at least you can compare the two against each other. Now I have a small confession. I've been making your Concord pie recipe for years. 
it's a favorite. And what I like about it is you just don't about you just you just don't encounter another Concord pie. You know, people might bring apple, cranberry, what have you, but there's usually not another Concord green pie. And That's your great. recipe calls for two cups and two tablespoons. And I freeze, I, I make the pulp, you know, in, in a large quantity and then divvy it up and then make it for the next year or two. However, I have also made it with two cups. I have made it with two cups, slightly less. It still worked out, but I'm sure, I'm sure if they were side by side with the amount of cornstarch or whatever's in there, I would probably notice a difference, but on its own, it's just fine. Necessarily not everything. I mean, you have to give some quantity when you put it in print. <laughs> right. You know, but Woody's laughing because when he first came here, I made him Concord grape pie from how old were those grapes? 18 years. <laughs> you see, they have very leathery skins, and I have them in a bowl jar and in the freezer. In the freezer. And well, <laughs> they were not bad. It's just that they were less vibrant. You know, they were <laughs> It's surprising how long you can keep certain things in the freezer, like mm. cherries, sour cherries, if you add sugar to them, rhubarb, and the sugar preserves them much longer. Mm. It keeps the color, but the color is not the important part. The important part is the flavor and the texture. But thank you for confessing. <laughs> well, I just thought I'd let you know, because you're so, so precise that, you know, initially I felt I was doing something terribly wrong to not have those two extra tablespoons. I know, I know. <laughs> I know, but later on, I was like, ah. and since I now have the honor of actually interacting and telling you, it was my big thrill. <laughs> that and my nieces really love those wreath candy frames, and I have it, and, and they want me to pack it up and ship them, and that's going to be my little nightmare to deal with, but that's okay. They'll love it. Huh? Let them dry, and it will really help on a road. Right. I have to dry it. I have to be patient long enough we with the drying. Pets, we have other types of uninvited pets. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so I put things in the oven. Woody made me a pie safe. You know, but certain things can even get through a pie safe. That's always my big fear. I'll have something like a big bag of flour, and he didn't put it in the plastic. He put, you know, it was heavy duty. It, oh, it didn't it? have a. It didn't have a lid. Wait, well, wait. whatever. The yeah. point is, you always have to think about things like that. You sure do. Well, okay. Scott, I think this was fun. Yeah, thank, thank you. Maybe when the cake bottle comes out, you can import us to Chicago. So, uh, <laughs> oh, and maybe we'll have live meetings back again. Oh, oh that would be so oh, nice. Yes. And, and uh, I, I wanted to, first of all, tell you a quick little story about your beloved, very famous editor, Maria Guarnaschelli. Um, and actually, she was on a trip with me once at IACP and she helped me pick out something in a gift shop. She knew she knew all the details about fine stuff. So uh, she looked like a character out of Orphan Annie. And uh, she, she was, but Lynn Rosetto Casper, that wonderful uh, cookbook author who, who wrote The Splendid Table. And I think her radio show was called that on public radio. But uh, Lynn uh, was speaking at the Greenbrier Food Writers Conference and of course, Maria was her editor for her award-winning book too. And uh, she she said how difficult she was to work with. And not really difficult, Lynn, but she said, Maria, I know I sent you, you had to go to a psychiatrist because of me. And Maria shouted back, that's okay, Lynn, I needed it. So <laughs> I thought you'd get a kick out of that. But yeah. uh, uh, I'm sorry, did you want to say something? Okay, yeah, just one last thing. Uh, <clears throat> cookbooks, unfortunately, have errors, <laughs> whether it's by us or another author, or we like to blame on the publisher most of the time. But errors happen. So on our website for all of our books, uh, you can go on our website and go to the book pages where we have all the books pictured, then go to the actual individual book. And we have a corrections posting for every single book. And, and also we just, call it corrections yeah. and enhancements because there might be something we, we come upon that will make the recipe easier to do or, or yeah, enhancement. Like cream in the pie crust yeah. instead of water. So like you, you can go on there and, uh, and you know, print it off too that we can put in your book. And then uh, if you're going through the book, that doesn't seem quite right. 
oh, go check out the corrections page. Oh, they did correct that. So, mm -hmm. and anytime you think something's wrong, uh, give us a ring on the on the email anyway, and we'll, <laughs> and we'll do our best to answer it. Or mm -hmm. best. So. And hopefully there'll be so many printings of this book that you'll be able to correct all the typos uh, for the next printing. Getting and, anything corrected these days in publishing is harder than you think. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. You're absolutely true. But, but we do but offer that. Thank you for that yeah. wish. Yeah. And also, uh, I can't believe you're talking about your 80th birthday coming up in two years. And with what you're going to be doing for the 80th birthday, you know, uh, but uh, I, I just want to say, to quote that line from what, when Harry met Sally, that famous movie, I'll have whatever it is that you're having. That would be a bit so. difficult in this case, because you'd have to have had a grandmother who lived to almost 100, whose heritage was Austrian, not Hungarian. And I didn't do anything except eat lots of butter and sugar. <laughs> promote this along the way <laughs> but thank you yeah. I mean I have not had what do they call it work so but I'm beginning to feel my age well of course I'm always I've always been tired because I've always worked night and day and when I worked at NYU Medical Center when I was going to school at night that uh, I went to the thyroid clinic because it was free at Bellevue and the doctor said well why are you tired all the time what do you do during the day and I said I work here and he said what do you do at night? And I said, I go to school. And he said, how many nights? And I said, all week. And he said, and you wonder why you're tired. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not complaining, but it, this is pretty tough doing this revision. It's intense. I always say it's easier to make a dress from scratch than to try to alter it. Same holds true of a book, especially one as detailed as the cake well, book. We'll see you in two years. Be better. <laughs> or, or the next IACP conference, whenever it's going to be held. So uh, I'm going to miss you until then. So it's so good seeing you again. And we got to keep meeting like this. <laughs> thank you for having us on the yes, program. Thank you both. Thank you. Good night. Thank you all for coming and listening. I don't even know how many people are here because I can't see you. But <laughs> Kathy will give you a numbers count shortly. <laughs> thank you. Take okay. care. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Everybody. You too. Happy. Good night. <laughs>